Welcome back to the Sound Tracker Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Peacock. So sorry about the week off again. Uh, just everything is just coming together here to kind of kneecap the show at the moment. Um, I meant to do a sort of a st- update on the show, which is something I really need to do because it's, you know, we're approaching what could well be the end date for the show. So this is like a really important thing that I get up here. Um, I didn't realize how quickly that was coming up, but I need to get that recorded. It's just, again, a matter of finding time to put the whole thing together. So uh, I'm back, though, with Matt Chrisman again doing Pulp Fiction. We're moving on to the next Tarantino movie. And uh, yeah, just this is a fun one. You're, you're going to love it. And uh, if you haven't, check out the show's Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash soundtracker, which plays into the stuff that I was talking about right up front. Um, really important for this show. I know I say it every week, but I can't stress enough how important it is that and the ratings for the show. The two things that I absolutely need you as an audience member, if you're somebody who's listened to this show weekly or, or, you know, most of the time, um, check those, check out the Patreon and, you know, there's, there's, uh, 19 bonus episodes right now. You get two every month. And, uh, actually there will be four this month in April because I didn't have time to do my short form episode that I do. I started doing for the $3 tier where I just do some recommendations that kind of, you know, non, non soundtrack related material for the most part, but, uh, just a little bonus thing I was throwing in. So I'm going to do two of them this month. And then as far as the ratings go, uh, Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen, it takes one second to do a rating, to give the show a rating. And it is extremely important for the show. I wanted to hit 150 barely moved since then um and i you know i know that i'm talking such a small percentage of my listeners that haven't listened that haven't rated the show yet if they would do so i would cross that tomorrow uh it is it is a very minimal number that i'm looking for compared to the number of people who listen to the show on apple so please do so if you haven't it it takes one second i do 10 to 15 hours worth of work a week for these episodes and uh you know it would mean a lot to me if you could do the two seconds it takes to give the show a rating if you have not yet so all right here it is pulp fiction enjoy ain't no use running ain't nowhere to hide the beast is coming and he's got you in his sights gonna miss you and he ain't gonna mess around if you're a movie with original songs the soundtrack i'm gonna track you down oh yeah all right everyone welcome back so it's pulp fiction getting to i guess we're doing chronological at this point with with tarantino movies and joining me once again from chapo trap house i'm joined again by matt chrisman matt how are you doing I'm good. How are you? I'm great. So uh, this one came to be because initially, if I remember correctly, you initially said Pulp Fiction and then you were like, maybe, wait, maybe Reservoir Dogs. And then it yeah. eventually just, yeah. So it landed on Reservoir Dogs. And I, I, I haven't done a Tarantino movie since. Um, I, someone was going to do Jackie Brown and they kind of flaked out on me. But uh, so it just kind of made sense. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do another Tarantino. And, and you know, I asked you. Uh, if you wanted to come on and do it and, you know, thankfully you said, yeah. So what, but I don't remember you, you said you saw this in the theaters even, I think, right. You were, you saw this oh, yeah. back in theaters. Yeah. See, uh, I, I, I was, uh, allowed by my stepdad. He, I think he bought like the ticket for me so I could go in and, he, and know it was our very appreciative of that. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know, I forgot the jump cause I, you know, we talked about this in reservoir dogs that reservoir dogs, I always forget that reservoir dogs is like the definition of tight 90. And uh, like the jump from that to Pulp Fiction, I com- I always forget that this is two and a half hours because it doesn't feel, it never feels oh, no. that long. But uh, I have a whole ton of background information. Well, there, no, I'm sorry, I didn't take all of it. There was, there's so much fucking information on this movie out there. But uh, I, I have some really good stuff that I picked, but I'll get to that after I do the numbers. So let's do the numbers first. So Pulp Fiction released on October 14th, 1994 in the US. And it had oh. its official debut at Cannes in, on may 21st 1994 where it debuted to this huge amount of fanfare but it also uh was one of the ones that got booed when it came right it's can they boo everything and uh but i mean it was a huge hit it won the palm d'or uh and so after that 
Tarantino spent five months hitting the road to try to promote it. And he played smaller festivals, built this huge momentum, and it paid off. It, it obviously arrived at this huge amount of critical acclaim. It cleaned house during award season, although it only actually won one Oscar. And uh, a very controversial best picture loss to, well, one that's in the top 10 here with it in a minute. Um, but, it, I, you know, here's something I did not remember. I did not remember in my head, this was like, you know, like all Miramax indie films, that this is one that like started in like a uh, uh, limited release and then sort of expanded. But this is one that debuted wide the week that it came out. And I, I yeah, and it was, uh, I believe it tied for first place at the box office with Sylvester Stallone's The Specialist. So there's a funny story behind that. The numbers here, it, yes, it did actually technically. It, it got first place and it edged out the specialist playing on half as many theaters. However, there is a belief that there, the Weinsteins fudge their numbers by a half a million to knock it into first. Uh, so there's, a, but I they, don't think they would ever do anything underhanded. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, either way, it pay, either way it works out that it went on to make $107 million back against an $8.5 million budget. And, and it had uh, 10 million marketing costs, which I never, that's one of those things that are hard to find, but I actually found 10 million marketing costs. So it had about 18 million into this movie and it, it made 107 million back. It was the first indie film to crack a hundred million at the box office. So, uh, but that's funny. Yeah. The specialist, which it's funny. I actually saw, cause in, in little ass Tiff in Ohio, Pulp Fiction was not in the theater here the weekend that this came out. So I actually saw the specialist in the theater. I remember seeing that <laughs> in theaters. Uh, the top 10 though, the week that it came out, number one was Pulp Fiction. Number two was the specialist. Number three was Wes Craven's new nightmare, which I don't mm. feels like it, for whatever reason, that feels like it's a few years older than this movie in my head, but like they were in theaters at the same time. Uh, number four is the river wild. Number five is the little giants. Number six is only you, which I didn't remember. It's uh, Robert Downey Jr. And Marissa Tomei. Number seven, Forrest Gump. The, like I said, the controversial, just not even controversial at this point. It's just a, uh, an embarrassment <laughs> looking back that, that that was the Oscar sweep that year. Uh, and there's another funny Forrest Gump thing I've got coming up. Number eight, Exit to Eden with uh, <laughs> Dan Aykroyd and Rosie oh O'Donnell. Oh, God, S&M. that fucking movie. That <laughs> traumatized my ass, and I rented that thing. <laughs> yeah, I had forgotten that that existed until I was doing the top ten, and I didn't even have to look it up. Like, immediately when I read it, I was like, that's the one with Dan Aykroyd and Rosie O'Donnell. Like, well, they, they stuffed them into bondage gear? Ugh. There was like an enema joke in the preview. I remember there being an enema joke in the trailer for that movie that they showed on television. Sounds right. Like, <laughs> uh, number nine, Shawshank Redemption. And number 10 was Quiz Show. So like a lot of like Oscar prestige things in the top 10 that. that yeah, movie. you know, that, that was like the what October. That's the opening of Oscar season back when we kind of really still had that. Yeah, they and they really, you know, I mean, you got. Yeah, Shawshank, Quiz Show, The Specialist. You got, you got three three Oscar category movies right there. Um, I mean, James Woods should have been nominated. The for old, that's his the thing I remember the, the most. bad guy in The Specialist. That's what I remember the most from that movie is that James Woods was a really great villain in that movie because he says we know now. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, I also remember the uh, sex scene between Sylvester Sloan and Sharon Stone where they're. Uh, uh, they're in a big shower and they like lie down on the tile and you just see it's very Sly's ass forward. <laughs> they really give you the whole contour of the cheeks in that scene. Like He, he was clearly very proud of his, that was him at like his, the height of his steroidal musculature. And he was very proud of it. <laughs> I always confuse that one with assassins as to which one, like the, just in the name. I know which one's which, oh, yeah. but like very similar concept and and very he, similar. He blows time. things up in the specialist and he shoots people in the uh, assassins <laughs> and assassins is Banderas, right? That's the mm-hmm. other. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Julianne Moore as the uh, love interest in that one, but no Stallone ass in that one. I don't know. Stallone ass in that one. It was a little later. <laughs> he's, he's too old to be showing cheeks at that point. <laughs> well okay so as far as the making of pulp fiction goes so roger avery wrote the first element of what would become pulp fiction in fall 1990 and the whole plan was they were going to do an anthology which they both said was inspired by mario bava's black sabbath where avery was going to write one section tarantino another and there was a third director who never materialized to do the last part 
Tarantino's part eventually went on to become Reservoir Dogs. And so in 92, he went back to the Pulp Fiction element uh, of that screenplay and finalized the screenplay as we know it. And in a very Quentin Tarantino move, he wrote the whole thing up by hand on a couple of notebooks and then had someone like With the to- worst goddamn grammar ever <laughs> seen by a human. <laughs> Illegible completely complete gibberish (laughs) yeah and and there's a story of the the woman who i didn't put this in here because it made tarantino sound like a dick but uh the woman who was like a a friend of his and like deciphered his screenplay for him had a sick uh, cat i think it was during the filming of this and wanted him to watch it for a weekend and he said no and it died when he didn't go over there for the weekend (laughs) oh george costanza style yeah, it really was. Uh, so because of studio bullshit, Avery only ended up with the story by credit in this movie. And because of that, he and Tarantino had a falling out over it, which persisted until last year, where they reunited for the, the Video Archives podcast, which is a fucking incredible thing that that Tarantino is just for the fun of it, like doing a podcast about VHS. Like, it's it's a, a very Tarantino sort of move to do. And uh, it's a fun show, but... Uh, TriStar Pictures turned down the script because they said it was too demented, and Avery summed up their notes by saying, this is basically what he said their notes were summarized as. This is the worst thing ever written. It makes no sense. Someone's dead, and then they're alive. It's too long, it's too violent, and it's unfilmable. (laughs) So, uh, I like that they had problems following the lack of chronological order. Like, someone's alive, someone's dead, how does that happen? Or someone's dead, then they're alive, how does that happen? But uh, Miramax weinstein was enthralled by it and this was the first independent this is the first film under miramax that they fully financed themselves so uh you know i know the weinsteins are god awful people but uh they no there's no but here i don't know why i'm saying but jesus christ let me editor cut that out no they they took a chance on this one though and uh I didn't know that. I actually thought that this was something that had been, you know, made and then Miramax, as as they always did, took it and and fucked around with it a little bit. But that was basically, you know, Harvey, Harvey liked this script and this is what we got out of it. But Uma Thurman turned down the role of Mia Wallace. Now, imagine having this happen. Quentin Turner. Tarantino was so desperate to have her as Mia, he called her and read her the entire script over the phone, which convinced her or 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 beat her down enough that she took on the role. But uh could you imagine him reading a 240 page script or whatever it was to you? On the phone? <laughs> uh, Keitel convinced Bruce Willis to take part in the movie, knowing he had Bruce Willis had been a fan of Reservoir Dogs. And, uh, you know, he he reached out to him and told him he was going to do it because Tarantino had wrote the role of the wolf specifically for Harvey Keitel. And also the parts of Honey Bunny and Pumpkin were written with Amanda Plummer and Roth both in mind when he did it. Uh, the 1964 Chevy Malibu convertible that Vega drives belonged to Tarantino at the time. I, this is really funny. And it was stolen during the production of the film. And in 2013, a police officer saw two t- kids strap stripping an older car and he arrested them. When he looked up the owner of the vehicle, he found the VIN had been altered and it turned out that it was Tarantino's stolen car. So that car got stolen on the set of this movie and didn't show up for another 25 years. Uh, because some kids were trying to strip it down but the and it had been purchased by a new owner who didn't know that it had been stolen when he bought it so it's like been passed around a whole bunch through people stealing it apparently but i how do you not notice that your (laughs) car had been stolen during the filming you Uh, think (laughs) <laughs> five million dollars of the eight million dollar budget went towards the actor salaries and the largest chunk of the budget outside of paying actors went towards creating the Jackrabbit Slim set, which I also very impressive that they built that entire set from the ground up. I had just assumed Uh, the lost art. I know. I know. I assumed it was some sort of practical location that they found and we're like, you know what, we're going to use this. So Paul Calderon in Pulp Fiction is uh, Paul, the bartender at the strip club. He's there's a scene where he and Jules are walking down the hallway to marcellus's office it's the scene after chronologically after mia overdoses and they have that kind of weird hello jules was written for samuel L. jackson specifically but paul calderon almost got that role after a great audition so when jackson heard this he flew to los angeles and went to tarantino and and auditioned again to secure the role but that they kind of like did a little nod to what it could have looked like you know because it's like the two of them kind of that long shot of them walking down the hallway together but we almost had a very different movie if he had gotten that role, but they, it's cool that they gave him a small part regardless of, uh, you know, not 
not making the cut as jewels but uh could you imagine this without without saying no 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 yeah it, the mind no of bells <laughs> um so travolta went and this is with james lipton on inside the actor studio he went to the the details of of tackling vincent vega and so he had never done heroin he spoke to a recovering heroin addict that that tarantino knew and he asked him what it felt like to be on heroin without actually like using it and going method and uh the friend explained if you want to get to the bottom envelope feeling of getting on being on heroin get plastered on tequila and lie down in a hot pool then you'll barely touch the feeling of what it might be like to be on heroin so he and kelly preston his wife uh basically had a really fun weekend preparing for the role by getting <laughs> shit faced and, and laying down in a warm pool you not know, doing any actual heroin though come on yeah i know i know show come commitment on, to your craft I, that's probably Scientology probably doesn't let you use use heroin. <laughs> well, then you should you be able to not even not have to use uh, anything. You should just use your mind. <laughs> that's what Scientology is about. It's total mind <laughs> domination. I, well, v, uh, Vincent almost went to a few other people. He was not specifically written for Travolta. Now, Tarantino loved Travolta and Travolta got the role basically based on his like performance in the movie Blow Up. Uh, mm -hmm. Tarantino's huge fan of that movie or wait blow out which one's yeah i was confused blow up was the original then that's the yeah blow, blow out yeah i could i always i always mix that up uh michael matson was originally who he had written for obviously makes sense because of their their history but he was making he, wyatt earp i know that is what a, what, yeah. a, what a good choice there michael really, <laughs> really I, killed it there mike he apparently he still like beats himself up over that choice because you know, I mean, the at... thing is, Michael Madsen, he's got a few tricks and he's got like an imposing vibe, but not a lot of range there. I don't know how much he was really ever going to be a big star. And I agree with you on that. You know, like, ter I mean, look, I know we just made a few jokes about Scientology and Travolta, but like at the end of the day, when Travolta is on, as he is in this movie, as he is in Blowout, as he is in, you know, various things that he's done throughout the years. Travolta is fantastic. Like he is a really like charismatic, one of a kind sort of actor. You know what I mean? So there's a reason yeah. that Travolta has had the career that he's had with all the ups and downs. There's a reason that he's like the comeback kid multiple times throughout his mm -hmm. career, you know, but I agree with you, Matson. I don't think he would have so much. A few other people, Daniel Day Lewis and James Gandolfini were in consideration at one time. And then as far as Butch goes, Butch was, uh, in, Matt Dillon was in talks for that, but never committed. And so originally, and actually he was supposed to be like a young up and coming boxer when he was like kind of drafting the script up. So he changed it to Bruce Willis and made him, uh, you know, a, a, like a grizzled older guy and Mickey Rourke passed on the role of Butch uh, to pursue his own boxing career. He also, this is funny. He also claimed that he didn't understand the script. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> um, he, uh, some of the scenes of Jimmy Dimmick were directed by Robert Rodriguez with the scenes where obviously because Tarantino's in front of the camera there. So Robert Rodriguez did those uncredited. Uh, the passage that, that Jules memorized, it was actually mostly made up by Quentin Tarantino and Samuel L. Jackson. They worked together to come up with this. The first part about the righteous man and Tyrion of evil is not tyranny of evil men is not real, but the second half, you know, the, I will strike down upon the of great vengeance, furious anger is a direct quote from Ezekiel 25, 17, uh, it's likely that Tarantino included it as a reference to the Sonny Chiba film Bodyguard Kiba, which is, again, a very Tarantino thing to pull something like that, you know, like that, that pull. You love Sonny Chiba. So this is so I don't. Did you know this Courtney Love claim that Tarantino originally wanted her and Kurt, Kurt Cobain to play the part of Lance and Jody? I, doubt. I have heard that. That seems yeah. like a, a, a large headache that you would not need to uh, give yourself while trying to make your second film. <laughs> well, and Tarantino, to his part, has denied that he's ever even met Kurt Cobain, let alone offered him a role in the movie. But uh, he did clarify later that he had originally written the role for John Cusack, who couldn't take it. So Stoltz is always his second choice. And Pam Greer auditioned for the role of Lance's wife. And Tarantino thought she had a great audition, but didn't cast her because he couldn't imagine Greer getting pushed around the way... Uh, Jody Rosanna does Arquette. in the movie. Yeah, yeah, Rosanna Arquette does in the movie. Like, uh, he couldn't imagine her playing like a not like, like that character's weak. I like that she kind of holds her own when they come in during the the overdose scene, and it's just like fuck you guys. <laughs> like, she's not gonna let you push me around. But um, 
people that auditioned for the role of Mia, Isabella Rossellini, Meg Ryan, Daryl Hannah, Joan Cusack, and Michelle Pfeiffer were all offered that role. He said that out of all of those he preferred the most, it was Pfeiffer, besides Uma, obviously. Jennifer Aniston was also the one who apparently came the closest, losing out to Uma Thurman in the end. But there were... uh there are actually, there's a whole thing of leak documents. I'd only wrote down some of these, but there's a fucking ton. There's a whole thing that shows short lists for most of the characters that you can find on the internet. Uh, it's worth finding just to imagine how some of them might have gone in like an alternate universe because the two other ones that uh, Danny DeVito was the, a short list for the wolf and Michael Keaton was on the short list for Vincent Vega. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, Keaton as Vincent Vega would have been interesting. I oh think they man, would have... yeah, I've been thinking about that. Yeah, he would have been. I think he would have been very good. I do too. They would have been, I think, very different characters. You know, because yeah. like he's he always has that sort of coiled snake energy. You know what I mean? Because Vincent is like, you know, he's he's kind he's, of a goof. He's yeah, goofy. he's he is. He's like a doofus. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The Ke- the Keaton uh, Vincent would be a little more a little more menace underneath there. Right. Yeah. Like like Vincent is. I mean, he gets killed because he, he was taking a shit. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and he left his gun on the fucking bed. <laughs> he left his machine gun on the counter while taking a dump in the house of the guy he was trying to kill. Just And he was reading his book in there. <laughs> yeah. And that's the funny thing about it is, we'll, we'll get to it a little more, but like his character, uh, you shouldn't call him a dude because he's not, that's the thing. He's not totally stupid. Like you see him. He's fairly sharp. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he's, he knows shit. Uh, he just does dumb things and he thinks he doesn't, he thinks with his, he, he doesn't think things through. That's his biggest mm-hmm. problem. So last couple of things here. Tarantino was a collector of uh, vintage television show board games. So during the filming of this movie, he and Travolta uh, lots of nights sat on the floor and played the welcome back cotter board game. So that's like <laughs> just funny thing to think about. Uma, and uh, you know, Travolta for again for all the Travolta stuff almost every story you hear about him the Scientology thing aside almost every story you hear about Travolta basically rolls around the fact that he's like a super nice guy you know what I mean like you never hear bad stories from people who have worked with him of having a bad experience with him except for the people who he uh, massaged him perhaps (laughs) oh shit I forgot about that yeah There's there's, there's misunderstandings in the massage room I forgot all about that. Fuck. See, I've said that is exactly what John Travolta wanted. So he would be very happy to hear that you forgot about that. <laughs> Christ. Once again, so Scientology many... for the win. Mind <laughs> over matter. Uh, well, it's a, to to my point here. He Uma was very nervous about dancing with them. And and he like took her aside right before they recorded and said, you're all right. Just shut up and twist. And and like calmed her down to jump into the scene because she was like, wow, you know what? I can, I can do that. And then the final one and Matt, I'm telling you right now, this is such a 1994 relic of a thing. And you can find it on YouTube. I decided to check it out after I read this. So the only reason I'm including this is because of how fucking hilariously 1994 this is. So Pulp Fiction was released in 1994. And I said, I was going to bring up Forrest Gump one more time. So Forrest Gump had come out at the same time. And Right around the same time, Mad TV had debuted on Fox. So one of Mad TV's earliest skits was a mashup that they called Gump Fiction. And it was... Oh, I remember that. You remember that? Oh, yeah. I I remember that that debuted. I was very excited because I I loved Pulp Fiction. And there's this uh, new set sketch comedy show referencing a film that at that point I was obsessed with. It is... Okay, so like... I I made... sure to watch that i was like clapping my hands together with all the references and it's like oh and then there's gump too he's he's forrest gump but that they came out the same year so it's two things <laughs> yeah he's he's vincent vega so like among the jokes that you'll find in there first of all there's an r word thrown around on national television because it was 1994 like it literally is just like right towards the end um so expect that you've got uh there's like 30 seconds worth of jokes about, you know what they call shrimp? You know what they call shrimp in France? Um, uh, perfect. I remember. Lo- the one I remember, though, and the thing that would definitely would not be allowed now is the gimp was Lieutenant Dan. Yes, yes, yes. That was- <laughs> but it looks nothing like Gary Sinise. I had no idea that was what it was supposed to be until he said, if you'd have let me, I wouldn't be a gimp if you would let me die in Nam. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, you can find that on YouTube if you feel like that. You obviously remember, but if you were listening to this right now and, and wondering what that might look like. Uh, yeah, check it very, out. It's very... definitely it's a time capsule. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the movie. Um, you know, I kind of tried to go into this. I've seen, God, I don't know how many times I've seen Pulp Fiction, but I kind of tried to go into this one and it's like I know it's, you could say this and it's so hard to do but i tried to go into it like i had never seen this before and it lasted mm-hmm. for about five minutes but yeah the one thing that i noticed in that first five minutes is the beginning of the movie you can kind of tell like the, the pumpkin and honey buddy their conversation before they start talking about robbery they just seem like a loving couple but there's something about them that like you can tell that like even if you didn't know tarantino if you just jumped into this movie not knowing anything you could tell that there was something off about them. And I think it's Amanda Plummer. She's so good at playing like a yeah. liar. You know what I mean? Yeah, a little weird. But at the same time, there is something kind of sweet about those that those two. Like they're genuinely like really in love, like how scared she is when it looks like something's gonna happen to him at the end with 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 Jules. You know what I mean? Like they're they're not like, I don't know, you've seen the like natural born killers or something which i mean again i just did that recently and i talked about how like they're truly in love in there but like Mm -hmm. they're this is very warm like they're very warm with one another you know what i mean like there's something almost sweet about it for the fact that they're about to rob a diner full of people although we never see them kill anybody so who knows how how far they would have actually gone yeah you get the impression that they unless something happened accidentally they were never going to actually kill anybody and and then I love their reasoning for why a restaurant's a good place to rob because it's really well reasoned. And like when they talk about how I've worked in, I worked in restaurants throughout college. Like they're not wrong about mm-hmm. like what the kitchens look. If I were working in the kitchen and somebody robbed the restaurant, I'm in the back fucking room, man. I ain't playing hero. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting out of that place. I'm safe. Uh, but then they rob it and we're off and you get miserly, which is such a, I mean, obviously we'll talk more about that when we get to the soundtrack, but like, I don't know what an incredible, like, ear for okay this is my opening song <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's pretty is... wild just that that instant riff just it and then launching you into the credits yeah and yeah it just like you said launching is the perfect word like you are off to the fucking races uh and we get to jules and vincent in the car now for better or worse i think i know pulp fiction influenced again for better or worse a whole ton of shit for the next really up and to i even... watched all of it I watched quite a few too, but I feel like the thing that m- informed so much of American film for the next decade was the com- is that conversation between, cause like it's okay. The idea of typically in a movie and you get, some, I mean, you get this in Reservoir Dogs too, but I don't think to this qu- quite to this extent where you've got these hard criminals, you know, typically in movies like this, they're like one of two things they're stoic or they're crazy. You know what I mean? Like they don't say anything or they're like lunatics who are like, you know they'll bite your fucking nose off if you look at them kind of thing Mm -hmm. what you've got instead are these two like if they have to be cold-blooded killers who are just having a conversation you know what i mean like it's it's yeah what if what if criminals were like you yeah (laughs) yeah yeah like the whole royale with cheese discussion but it was so fresh it was just like it was just it was just like dudes rock you know what i mean that's what you've got it's a dudes rock scene just guys being dudes in a car uh and there's so many funny bits in there like I love I love how grossed out Jules is at the idea of mayonnaise on fries. He just keeps going, bah, bah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, bemoaning not having shotguns. But this is where they set up because it takes a minute to come back to it. But you get it, 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 just, you don't know who these people are. They're just talking about the thing with Mia and the foot massage and Marcellus, and he's their boss. But like you, you've never seen these people. You don't know if you're even mm-hmm. going to see these people at this point. And uh I love how proud of how good at foot massages Jules is when he asks him if he's good at it too. Like, because again, this is why I said it's impossible to imagine anyone but Samuel L. Jackson, because at this whole scene, he's cool as a cucumber. You know what I mean? He's just like, Oh, come on, man. And then he even says, let's get into character before he does it. But he just fucking, the way he turns it on as soon as they get to the job is just incredible. Like he goes from like laughing or joking about foot massages to walking in and just like, and again, the whole apartment scene at the beginning, there's just so much good shit. Like those dudes all know they're fucked as soon as they walk in the door. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, think are... Brent, I think Brent thinks he can talk his way out of it. I, <laughs> I think he I think he he's, he has confidence in himself. <laughs> um, misplaced. <laughs> yeah, very misplaced. And it just I think I think. The, OK, I think the, re, the exact moment 
because even after he shoots us, I'm trying to remember if chronologically, if he shoots his friend on the couch, but the, the part where, you know, it is before he shoots his friend. I think the moment Brett realizes that he's dead is when Samuel Jackson does the, do you mind if I have a sip of your beverage to wash this down and then kills the whole drink to the point where you're hearing that like last yeah, remnants slurp. of yeah, <laughs> yeah. last remnants of the drink. Yeah. You're not getting any more of this. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the moment that Brett was like, we're never getting out of this. And then yeah, there's just so much good like him screaming, does Marcellus Wallace look like a bitch? I love the way he says big kahuna burger, a big kahuna burger. And he's like, big kahuna burger. <laughs> I heard yeah. they got some tasty burgers. <laughs> I've heard so much mentioned about how good the burger and the menu looks, and they're not wrong, but I'll tell you what this burger looks they don't even like focus on the burger but every time he takes a bite of that burger i'm like that does look like a good goddamn it looks burger. really good <laughs> that's a hawaiian burger joint <laughs> and i like when he asks jules or when he asks vincent if he's tried it before and he just shake he like he doesn't even like he's like the kid would be like he doesn't care at all he just kind of shakes his head like no back in the background like he doesn't he's reading a magazine or something like that yeah. okay what do you think the briefcase is let me ask you if you buy into there's like a ton of theories do you have one on what the briefcase is uh i it's a reference is what it is <laughs> like anything in a tarantino movie like <laughs> his entire filmic approach is to bring together things that he has seen almost almost like a spirit medium type of way i don't think that he has like deep structures that he's trying to uh to articulate i think that he he just brings together uh, influences, references, symbols, and and intuitively fits them together, almost like an outsider artist. Uh, so I think that the the uh, the briefcase is a MacGuffin in a pure sort of almost platonic sense, and and a reference uh, specifically to uh, Robert Aldrich's "Kiss Me Deadly," oh, uh, which it- has a nuclear suitcase in it that i glows okay see what like i don't honestly think he even really thought about what was like in the uh universe of the film in it and see i i've never seen that movie so i'm gonna have to check that out but i think you have touched on a little bit my point my whole thing with it is i don't even think about what the fuck's in the the only part where i'm like hey what's in that brief can i where i like i get a little tinge of like i would like to know what's in there is when tim roth looks in it and he says is that what i think it it's is? beautiful that's the only moment in the whole movie where i because like you said to me it's a MacGuffin, and it, even the first time i saw this i was never like i didn't realize because again 1994 there weren't like internet message boards and shit so like i didn't even realize there was like a passionate debate on what was in the briefcase i just assumed honestly to me i just assumed it was like jewels or something you know what i mean i think when i like my 13 14 year old brain or whatever was like well, it's probably just a bunch of gold, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but yeah, it, ultimately, it does not matter. I do like, even though it would be a very weirdly supernatural thing in this, the idea of Marcellus Wallace's soul being in there, only because it's so fucking goofy. It's such a goofy theory. And, and it plays into that. I, the, 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 the One of the supporting things is that he has that band-aid on his neck, like this, you would remove your soul through the back of your neck or something. I don't know. There's like a whole bunch of reaches to get to that. I mean... But. You know, death of the author and anything, everything, but uh, Tarantino just is not, those are not his concerns as a filmmaker. You know, like if he, for him, film itself is like spirituality. There, There's no need to further articulate uh, spiritual symbolism because the movies themselves are the spiritual symbolism. It's a good, we kind of touched, yeah, we talked a little bit about like, I, this there was a conversation sort of about how he looks at movies but it was more so about like problematic aspects when we were talking about reservoir dogs but yeah at the i agree with you i think you said like to him film is like the ultimate like religion or point to this so yeah i don't really give a shit what's in it but i was curious if you had any sort of uh theories as to that so uh but we get to our first time jump here which is where the prelude to vincent and mia but it opens with this meeting butch and marcellus uh and I love, I, I, okay, in a movie full of incredible actors, incredible characters, Butch is probably my favorite. I think the Butch section is probably my favorite section of the entire movie. As good as all the stuff with Jules and, or with Jules and Vincent and uh, Mia and Vincent, I just love, like, you know, Bruce Willis, 
uh, again, Bruce Willis is another one like Travolta, you know, and then obviously we've learned more as to why Willis was doing some of the movies that he's been doing lately. But like when he when Bruce Willis was on, God damn, what a what a magnetic actor. He yeah, was. And this is right. This is the crossroads of his career after his heart was broken uh, in the early 90s when his full artistic ambitions were uh, ran aground Icarus like with the failure of his blues album return to Bru- uh, return of Bruno and his pet passion project Hudson Hawk. Uh, mm-hmm. And it is, I don't think it's a coincidence that around this time he gives up on his hair completely and just shaves his head and starts playing cops all <laughs> uh, exclusively because the light had gone out of his artistic career, but he still has a few, uh, a few gallons left in the tank and and this time when he sh- he's sh- he's sh- he's got a shaved head, but it definitely feels like a character choice and not just a resignation with w- which is how it feels when he's bald in the later Die Hard movies. And you know it's funny you mentioned that because I've seen again I've seen Pulp Fiction God knows how many times, but in my head every every time I watch it, it had been, it's been actually it had been a minute since I'd watched Pulp Fiction this last time a couple of years, and. uh in my head, he was shaved bald because I'm so used to that aspect to the point where I was like, it's kind of weird seeing him with like a little bit of hair. And like, you see what his actual hairline looks like. He doesn't mm-hmm. like take any of it down. He doesn't take the top off. Like, it's like, yeah, it's absolutely a character choice the way he did it. I do want to also point out that I absolutely fucking love Hudson Hawk. And in that period of movies where he plays cops, Striking Distance is really fucking fun. Striking too. Distance, uh, delightful film. Uh, one uh, beautiful, you know, the film, the the the, the uh, one of the main characters in that film uh, is the city of Pittsburgh, and you don't see them getting to be uh, highlighted in many films. Also, Sarah <laughs> Jessica Parker's character in that movie is the only person I've ever seen in a film with my last name. So, oh, is that her character? I haven't, I don't see. Yeah, and I and of- I know that because there's a scene where they write her name on the duty roster on a, on the like a whiteboard. And so they just show her them right. And when I was a kid, that just blew my fucking mind. <laughs> well, and it has Dennis fucking Farina in it. What a goddamn! I might watch Striking Distance tonight after we get done here. Uh, but yeah, I, I I thank God for his comeback because honestly, we got another Die Hard out of it. We got Last Man Standing, which is a really underrated fucking movie, Walter Hill movie. Oh yeah, um, yeah. It's it's but yeah, Bruce Willis is great, and I think. Okay, well, I, you know what? What is your favorite? Do you have a favorite section of this since it's split up? I mean, it's like the whole movie has to exist as one. But like, do you have, you know, we spend time with multiple characters who don't really interact with one another at certain points. So do you have a per- particular section of this that you like more than the others? Uh, hmm. I, I the, the things that when I saw it the first time it stuck with me and, you know, since it was so formative, that's always going to be the ones, you know, I can, I can w- look back and appreciate things I didn't like before. And, and, and I have, but the ones that just jumped out at me when I saw it, obviously uh, the opening introduction to, to Jules uh, and, and Vincent, but the overdose scene, mm-hmm. which was one of the most gripping cinematic experiences I'd had until that point, obviously I hadn't seen that many movies as a kid, but, I didn't know you could feel like that kind of uh, anxiety in a film, in a movie theater. (laughs) Uh, The scene in the basement, obviously, uh, of the pawn shop uh, and everything after Marvin gets his head blown off. uh, The whole cleanup (laughs) sequence. Delightful. Uh, That would probably be my second favorite section. Least favorite. And I think this is a pretty common uh, uh, view, especially among people who saw it as kids. Uh, fucking uh, uh, Butch talking to his awful French girlfriend. <laughs> uh, the older I've gotten, the more I've actually come to kind of love that character. Yeah, me too, of course. But I'm just, I remember as a kid, that's the scene where I'm like, okay, okay, can we get, can we get rid of this broad? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I see what you mean. As a kid, you want more like, yeah, because when I was younger, I was like, this is, I don't like this character. She's weird. And now I love her for that fact. I love how fucking weird her character is. Oh like, yeah. No, I mean, it, it definitely, it fits the mood and everything. Uh, but it definitely, it's, it's funny that that's the, the Roger Avery part, apparently, you know, the, the whole boxing thing was his, right? Yeah. Yep. And 
it definitely made me uh, side with Tarantino when they were feuding after that. It's like, <laughs> that's, that's the most annoying part. I mean, you shouldn't be arguing that you deserve credit. Get out of here. <laughs> I, I, you know, I can see as we're talking about the, the section we're in right now, I can see where maybe I don't remember what studio it was. It's way back up on my notes. The one that said that it was unfilmable because look, if you're looking at it from like a common audience perspective, I could kind of see where maybe reading this, they got nervous because it does kind of subtly play with time. Like you jump right from Vincent and Jules in their like suits and, you know, shooting people to they walk in in those like dorky, as they're called later on, dorky clothes. And like, there's no explanation of how it got there. And I can see where like, again, like putting your faith in audiences. Yeah. <laughs> like, can't looking do that at anymore. Score, no, you can't. Like if you've look, if you've ever looked at like cinema scores from this time or any time in history, I don't know if cinema score actually existed when this came out. I forget when that started. But anyway, you know, uh, told you i just did zodiac i think zodiac got like a b minus or something cinema mm-hmm. score you know you can't trust them you can't trust Zod- cinema score it's it's a it's a terrible thing but uh well you can trust it that's what you're that's what got your audiences you know what i'm saying yeah so i i understand maybe why because it doesn't like most movies will be like six hours earlier or two, you know what i mean this does not do that it doesn't handhold that way it's just like you're going to understand that we have now this takes place before what you saw earlier. And mm-hmm. uh, so I'm actually surprised the studio didn't just say, add some timestamps. <laughs> you know what I mean? Make it easier on these dummies and we'll, we'll understand what's going on. But you force, I like the foreshadowing of Butch and Vince's eventual meeting later where they like kind of have a standoff there, but they don't yeah. meet each other again in the movie until Butch fucking shoots him dead. Uh, but like, he was, he called punchy. You know, yeah, it's like, I think you heard me punchy. <laughs> you ain't my friend Palooka. Yeah, it's such a great, great, like old Western sort of di- standoff that they have, you know, like the two, the, the bound by gunslingers. Fate. Yeah, bound by fate without knowing they're bound by fate. Mm-hmm. And like really, but not even bound by, it's more bound by coincidence is what happens in the end here. But uh, I actually like, okay, so we talked about Vincent as a heroin addict, which is it, I like actually how he plays Vincent on heroin. You know, because like you see so many movies where they like melt into a chair and they're like, oh, but like he's just kind of like he's kind of chill. You know what I mean? That's why yeah. I don't know. He's is he a heroin addict or is he just a heroin enthusiast? And that you know, might be the better he, word. It's like he's pretty functional. I even have in my notes, it almost seems like it's something he just kind of casually does. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like he he yeah, because yeah. he he like He's not like a junkie. He's not like, like, there's not like, there's, there's no, there's no feeling that like, if he doesn't get this, he's going to like need, I don't remember what the yeah. medicine is. It keeps you from fucking dying when you're, when you're coming off. But you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. nothing like that. Um, I do love the scene where he's in with Lance and Jody and he's like, is that the one with all the shit in her face? He's like, no, that's, <laughs> no, that's my wife. That's Judy, that's my wife. <laughs> well, and I realized something too. That scene is basically what you're seeing is Chekhov's heroin. You know what I mean? Like you see him use <laughs> yeah. it, but like that's what it, it it it's you don't I do like how it comes back though, because like again, even my so my girlfriend had never seen this before. Okay. Wow. And uh I know she's a lot of she's got a lot of movie blind spots, but she watched this for this. And uh when when she dug the heroin out of the pocket, she was like, "Oh no!" You know what I mean, like, <laughs> so it is great watching it with somebody who hadn't seen it for watching it come back like that. But uh, yeah, it feels like getting all fucked up. And this is again when we talk about Vincent being kind of a big doofus. It kind of feels like as nervous as he is about like I can't fuck this up. I've got to take my boss's wife out for a good time. Um, he threw a fucking guy off of a four story balcony for touching her feet. Like I mm-hmm. can't fuck this up. It feels like using heroin before you go to do that is like the definition of like the worst possible idea. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's a self-destructive tendency there. Or well, I guess the idea is he's nervous about it. He's anxious. Well, what's a good way to deal with anxiety? Heroin. <laughs> well, and lucky for him, she's all loaded up on cocaine. So like it, yeah. it works. Uh, Jack Rabbit Slims is a really great name for a place, by the way. Like, I love oh, yeah. that name. I don't know if it's based on something or if it's just 
But I'll tell you what, I would absolutely go to a place like that all the time if it existed. If there were a place that had, and I, you know, it's funny too, the $5 shake thing now, like that's, that's, I know that you're lucky you get a $5. <laughs> right. The little, the little place around the corner from me that makes really good shakes, but there's just like, you know, it's just a standard milkshake. That's what you pay for them now if you get a large, but that, that mm-hmm. made me laugh. I forgot. It was like, is it like a $20 shake or something? And he's like $5. And I was like, like, well, uh, you're going to be, if you were to survive for another 20 years, you'd be real pissed, bud. <laughs> that's that's, that's everything but i like watching jules as he walks into the place sort of realizing the theme of the place that they're going as he's walking through it like he like was familiar with it but as he's mm-hmm. like sort of realizing that like he's like pointing at people like wait that's supposed to be yeah he's like, oh yeah <laughs> and you got some great cameos there uh Bashemi obviously is buddy holly but did you ever notice who plays dean martin in this movie oh they, they walk past martin and lewis i remember the guy playing Jerry Lewis is like a spazzing out a little bit. He's like going, it's, ah, a, ah, ah. it's it's Joe Pilato, Rhodes, the villain from Day of the Dead. Choke oh. on it. Choke on it. Yeah. Did that's not him. know that. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Which I and again, that is not a coincidence. It's not like he auditioned. Like I guarantee you, Tarantino oh, yeah. like, wanted to throw him in something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um don't give him any lines though, because holy crap, he was terrible as an actor. <laughs> yeah he's he's although he's the most fun part of day of the dead like he oh, is well, absolutely. certainly <laughs> uh so but it's my monkey farm frankenstein <laughs> i really love that line i i that is okay we're getting a little off topic here but uh day of the dead is is i pretty much hold romero's trilogy dawn of the dead is my favorite movie of all time but like i would hold day and night like way up there with that movie as far as those tri- that trilogy goes i know day was the one that like was like the, the the black sheep of the trilogy for a while but uh i think it's i think people have come around to it for sure yeah i i okay um but yeah so there's like an immediate sexual tension though between vincent and and mia you know what i mean like it's it's mm-hmm. not like and it's not overdone but like there's something there which is like the worst again you got vince who like knows <laughs> what could happen here. So he tells her, you know, they'd heard about Marcellus throwing Tony out of a four story window for a foot massage. And uh, I do like Uma gives that good little monologue about he threw him out of a window, but like that was not between him and me. The only time he ever touched me was when he shook my hand yeah. at my wedding, you know, like yeah. it's uh, the way things spread now, whether or not that's true or whether or not Marcel is actually talking about the window, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> it could be because he did give her a foot massage or because of something involving her and jealousy. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, the uh, Vince tries for his part, not to get up there and dance with her though. You know what I mean? He's like, no, no. So like, again, he's kind of a dummy, mm-hmm. <laughs> but he's smart enough to, to know better. You know what I mean? Like even after finding out that like, maybe that's not why he got thrown out of the window. I still probably shouldn't dance with my boss's wife, but uh, yeah. so yeah, then you get uh, the whole, as you talked about, okay, the overdose scene, you know, you touched on it a little bit earlier, but they get back. She overdoses. She uses his, his heroin thinking it's Coke. That whole scene, like you said, is so fucking intense because I, I know the first time I saw it, I thought she was done. You know what I mean? I was like, okay, yeah. so here's where the plot goes. She dies. She's got that fucking foam dripping out of her mouth. It's just blood everywhere. And it feels like the amount of time that it took him to get over there. Um, like, if, I don't know. It's one of those things where I was like, oh, she's dead. Like, they're going to, by yeah. the time they get there, she's going to be dead. Like, there's no mm-hmm. saving her at this point. But uh, him just ripping ass through the yard to get into lance's like he just runs right through his front yard i love lance too like prank call i don't know you wait wait i don't prank know call, prank call prank <laughs> call um i also oh god another very funny bit is when he's like pulling her out of the car like you know he's trying to save her life he's got her in his arms and 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 lance comes out and he's like who is this and he just drops her right in the yard yeah, just drops me. her right in front of everybody it's very funny <laughs> and like everybody's just fucking bickering in the house and like oh my god the like the shot the heart is one of those things that is like so ah, hard. I still, I still think back to how uh, I don't know if that caused or was triggered by a pre-existing n- needle horror, but either way, I was, I was like, I think I was subconsciously breathing so uh, shallowly while watching that scene that I kind of got lightheaded. <laughs> yeah, like the idea. Okay. It's the idea that you know that that needle is in her heart, I think, Ugh. is what really yeah. 
yeah it's not just like in her chest it is like that needle is sticking in her her heart muscle when yeah. she comes to um i do love again another example of vincent being a big dummy is when he says i gotta stab her three times <laughs> it's motioning that's so I'll... good i gotta stab her three times once no, you again idiot. dumbass just a <laughs> just a, a an agreeable heroin a heroin appreciating saint bernard well, I like that Lance is almost morbidly curious at that point too, because he's like, that yeah, one like I, I'm like, kind of curious myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, she lives, tells her Fox Force Five joke, and this is when we get the Butch. And like I said, oh, and and oh my God, the way the Butch story starts off, Jesus Christ, the way Walken says, "I hid this uncomfortable hunk of metal up my ass for two years," is okay, so fucking that, funny. That monologue is obviously genius, and the way that Walken delivers it is 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 great. But what, uh what's really remarkable is the way that it's structured as a joke, because once he says like, I, I, I hit it. Uh, the only place you could hide something, my ass, <laughs> like that's the punchline. And then this thing that had been this, you know, uh, very tense, emotional monologue, just all of a sudden becomes comedic and everything he says becomes humorous. <laughs> yeah like i forget what line it is in there there's a part where he takes a very long pause and it's this watch because yeah this watch fucking... was on your granddaddy's hand uh wrist when he was a marine in wake island <laughs> it's so good my grandfather I... was facing death he knew it none of those oh. boys had any illusions about getting off of that island alive well, and the best part about that is, like you said, it's it's it totally flips it on its head and it becomes this like big joke thing. But at the same time, it also establishes why Butch might be stupid enough to go back to his house and get himself in all this trouble to get it. You know what I mean? Like if look, if 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 I knew that this watch was important enough that like my father that I barely remembered had stuck it up his ass so I could get it, like mm -hmm. I I feel like I would be like, I owe it to him. <laughs> if nothing else, like I owe it to him to get that back. <laughs> uh but yeah so i also love have you ever seen curdled Cur the cab driver when when he kills after he you know he, he goes into the fight he's supposed to throw he kills the guy yes and uh yeah she's in curdle i love how they frame her because she's got very striking features you know what i mean yes, and like the light on her but I, I, my favorite line I mean, one of my favorite lines in this movie is when she asks what butch means and he says i'm american honey our names don't mean shit." i love that that's one of my favorite lines in the movie <laughs> absolutely great uh you yeah, know okay fabian so the the pot belly thing like the give me oral pleasure she's such a huge weirdo but like again much like pumpkin and honey bunny I, I do think that Butch and her relationship together is very cute. Like he's like, he's a, he probably is a little punchy. You know what I mean? And yeah. he's got this, like this sort of childlike innocence that she has yet. She also says things like give me oral pleasure. <laughs> and uh, which is a childlike way to say that. Um, yeah. But yeah. So their plan is to go to the South Pacific because their money will last longer. And that's when he has to go back for his watch. And I love when he's like, he's like throwing a fucking fit. He's like screaming at the beginning. And then he'd like to, again, it comes, yep. It comes down to their relationship being very sweet. But then as soon as he gets in the car, he's like, you goddamn idiot. Like, you forgot the watch of all the things to forget. You know, like he, uh... he, he saves it for when he's not around her, but um yeah travolta's death uh and it's caused by pop tarts or, or toast or something that he threw in the toast oven. it's like yeah, the ultimately yeah ultimately what causes travolta to die and uh god damn so i actually talked about this part in reservoir dogs uh talking about like the scene where bishemi's running through the street but the scene where okay so he sees marcellus he hits him and the funniest thing in any tarantino movie to me is the scene where the, not a scene it's a shot where after that accident you know butch comes to marcellus comes to and they're like you know do you think he, they're like i think he's dead and then he wakes up and they're like yeah that guy hit you over there and he aims and he shoots and he hits that woman right in the like right hip. in the hip yeah and what i love about that is that okay so like first of all you're dealing with the movie that takes place in california like the desire here would be you're casting a movie it should be some like it would be like something possibly like yeah you know, like like a model or something you know what i mean but this is just like a normal looking lady who looks so realistic like just somebody who's out getting fucking groceries or doing whatever she's doing with her day and happens upon this and then accidentally catches a bullet right in her fucking hip and it is just so goddamn you hear her like as butch is running away you hear her in the background like oh my god like it's I, so I, I, 
Yeah, and also just the thought that you might bleed out there on the street wearing those fucking awful shorts. Just <laughs> very <somebody> unflattering. <laughs> the shorts are what make it. It's those, yeah. but there were like 1994 shorts. That was like mm-hmm. 19, I mean, it wasn't like stylish to wear those, but you would not be abnormal to see shorts like that in 1994. You know what I mean? Like yes. those were some 1994 ass shorts. Um, according to the credits, Kathy Griffin is supposed to be playing herself. That's her name in the movie is Kathy yeah. Griffin. She doesn't have a name. So I was never, I never knew that until doing this show that she was supposed to do that. So yeah, we get to the weapon shop scene and I, okay, I'm a fucking sucker. I just watched a movie called the, the price we pay. I think the guy that made midnight meat train made it. Um, not the best movie I've ever seen. It's nothing you haven't seen a million times before. I had a couple of deaths that got me hooting and hollering that that made me like it enough to recommend, like, check it out if you have t- if you're dumb, nothing, nothing else to do. But the plot of the movie is one of my favorite things, and it's what happens here. Two criminals on the run end up in a place that is significantly worse than what they're, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, it's, and it's overdone. You've seen it a million times. But this one actually manages to surprise you because it's like, the last thing you expect, it's a couple of good old boy hillbillies. Zed comes and he's a cop. And it's like, well, what are they going to? But the, like immediately when they come to, you know, they have ball gags in their mouths and they're tied to chairs. You know what I mean? And like, could you imagine like you wake up and that's that's like you you thought you were, you know, you figure this guy's going to knock you out and call the police. <laughs> yeah. And that's how you wait. I and mean, technically, he did call the police. Uh, Peter Green, by the way, who plays Zed, is one of those incredible 90s that guys. He's like the villain in The Mask. And uh, yeah, yeah. Using uh, usual suspects. Yes. Yeah. And so, like, it seems like Zed's going to be the worst of it, the way he talks about Zed. But then they they do the whole bring out the gimp thing. And really, at the end of the day, the gimp is pretty uh, a non threat. He's just, I mean, he's the gimp. Yeah, <laughs> bring him along. He's just your little side, your little sexual violence sidekick. <laughs> well, it, this it just it does. Like I could imagine too. Again, talking about the suits at the par- the studio that were like this is unfilmable. Imagine getting to this scene and you're like, well, okay, this is grooving along kind of well. Where's this going to go? And then the next thing you know, this is where it goes. Like you could. I not- do. I remember that's another one. Like sitting in the theater and he just walks back and I'm like, what's going on? And they open up that the top of the box and then they bring out this fucking guy in the outfit and i just yes suffice to say it's nothing that i had uh encountered in manitowoc wisconsin until that point (laughs) okay see i couldn't remember where you grew up i was trying to remember because you were you were in ohio for a time so i didn't know if you were originally not from wisconsin originally that's right I, i knew that but i couldn't remember um so yeah and, and and it just like i said it just it just it fucking escalates so quickly it ramps up so quickly and it ends up at a different place than you expect and like even then i wasn't exactly sure what they were going to be doing to marcellus back there it was gonna be like sexual to- i didn't I actually didn't expect sexual torture until he opened the door you know what i mean like i was not mm-hmm. expecting it. i thought they were back cutting fucking body part you know what i mean who knew who knows like the gimp the sexual like the crazy sex guy was out there with with butch you know what i mean like i thought he was the crazy sex guy but uh yeah, they uh, Butch escapes, knocks the gimp out. The gimp's the only one who survives. Uh, <laughs> well, well unless... I, I don't think he's going to make it through the arrival of uh, of Ving Rhames' buddies. I think when That's... Marcellus's crew shows up, I don't think they're just going to let the gimp go. <laughs> That's true. As soon as I said that, I was like, no way. You got hard pipe hitting motherfuckers with blow torches and tweezers on the way or pliers yeah. on the way. He's not. He's in trouble too. Uh, but yeah, I like how that pays off too. Like you have to have a reason that Marcellus Wallace, who is you've gathered is like a hardened criminal would agree to let Butch live. And there's not many mm-hmm. you can think of <laughs> and saving him from what he saved him from. Yeah. And then just agreeing to like, I'll never tell anyone um, and I'll leave this town forever. That's a pretty good way to get that, to be like, okay, I could, I could, I can believe this. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, Cause it's all about codes. <laughs> It's all about right. the codes of outlaws. <laughs> well, and I mean, you get that great Ving Rhames line too, where he's, I'm pretty fucking far from okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I remember I, the, Tarantino has, has talked about the, how like, when he decides he's going to go back and, and, and save Marcellus and he's looking through the weapons, like he picks the samurai sword because that is the weapon of an honorable warrior. That makes so his, much sense. His honor is repaid by Marcellus's because they might be bad guys, and while Marcella, I mean, they're both bad guys. Like we know, Butch is a bad guy. He killed a guy in the ring, didn't care about it. We yeah. know that his poor trainer got tortured and maybe killed because of the scam he ran. He didn't seem to care too much about that. 
Uh, so he's not a good guy. Marcel's even worse guy, but they're both significantly better than uh, Zed and his buddies. So they have to maintain that line somehow, and that's how they do it. Well, and God, you know, I like how they leave to the imagination, like a pair of pliers. Does the only things he says is a pair of pliers and a blowtorch, right? He yeah. doesn't say anything else. So like whatever they're going to do to Zed, is very bad but yeah. i like that it leaves it to your imagination like well because i mean the blowtorch is like automatically where it's like oh good 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 god whatever is going to happen to you you're gonna you're gonna wish that that shotgun that blew your dick off and killed you instead you yeah know? <laughs> uh but yeah so and i'm glad you know what i am glad that they that butch and marcellus survive you know what i mean like they don't they don't kill either of them. even though like we just said they're not good people um i'm glad they get their Butch gets yeah. his like happy ending, quote unquote, and and Marcellus gets to keep doing whatever he's doing, you know. Um, uh, but we come back to the beginning, and this leads us to the Bonnie situation. So, you know, it's funny. Somebody did like a deep fake recently, but like I genuinely did believe that Alexis Arquette was Jerry Seinfeld the first time I saw this when it was like the profile shot of Alexis sitting in the bathroom. It wasn't until they came out screaming, you motherfucker, or whatever, and firing the gun that I was like, Oh, that's not Jerry Seinfeld. Now, I didn't know who Alexis Arquette was at the time. Uh, most certainly I did not realize who, who I was looking at here, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, I laughed when I saw that because I was like, I genuinely did think that was Jerry Seinfeld for like three <laughs> seconds when I first saw this movie. Um, but the two of them just kind of looked down yeah, and look at each other. Bodies. <laughs> yeah, like, my body's okay. Your body's okay. Okay. I guess we're good. Um, and Jules thinking it's an act of God. Jules is suddenly retiring. He suddenly, I love how he's saying religious shit in the car. And Vincent is just like, oh, come. like Vince is just like disgusted. You know what I mean? Like he's just yeah. like so annoyed with it. But again, Vince, the dunce turns around and shoots Marvin right in the face. Oh, that's the connection to mad TV, by the way, is that uh, can't think of the actor's name now that played Marvin, but he was in mad TV the first season. Yeah. Phil Lamar. Yeah. Phil Lamar. That's it. That's it. Um, speaking the same, we talked about with Butch and, and Marcellus, like you're not expecting <laughs> at all that the payoff for this is going to be him shooting Marcellus, like not just shooting him in the face, but like exploding his entire head in the backseat of that car. Mm -hmm. Um, bad trigger discipline. Another <laughs> example of Vince messing up, being a fucking just... goof him up, being a goofball. <laughs> I like to think Jules is like, I, I mean, he's like a shot over the face. Why'd you do that? And he, the Jules with like chunks of like brain and shit in his yeah. fucking hair is so goddamn like, it's so gross, but it's so, but it's like chunks of human in his fucking Jerry curl. And it is yeah. so fucking funny, but uh, this is where you get Tarantino is Jimmy. Now I know that the, the belief here is that Tarantino is a weak actor who shouldn't put himself in his movies. And we talked about this a little bit in Reservoir Dogs. I don't disagree that like he shouldn't have been in like movies outside of his own, but since he always writes himself as like a, like a, like a, uh, 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 like either a scumbag or a weirdo. Like I think he's perfect for it because he plays that sort of part very well. And uh, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy is a perfect example of that. Like what exactly is Jimmy's deal? Is he a criminal guy? Does he like do anything? Doesn't seem like he, he's like, there's no dalliances with like the criminal underworld with him. He's just friends. No, with his Jimmy. wife's a nurse. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's very hard to imagine him just hanging out with jewels. <laughs> that's what that's, that's so where funny. it feels fake. It, it does feel like fantasy camp. <laughs> but it's also it also makes it sort of funny because like that scene, the scene where they're like they're talking about what Bonnie's going to do when she comes home. And it's like that sort of like, what don't you call it? It's like just like a, an envisioning what would happen. Her walking in and all of them standing there looking up at her holding on to like, yeah. Marvin's like, missing headed body. Um, a bunch but of I gangsters just, doing a bunch of gangster shit. <laughs> and i like how vince this entire town can't appreciate what the favors that everyone is doing who vince who actually killed the fucking guy yeah can't appreciate the favors that everyone's doing for him because they're being a little curt with him about it you know what i mean like mm -hmm. wiping fucking blood on his towel you watch i watched you i watched you get them wet is such a great line uh but I love when they call the wolf and he's like at a stuffy dinner party when they call him. Like there's like a dinner party going on. Like what is the, I would love to know more about the wolf. And I know that you were supposed to at one point. Uh, Tarantino had written, where was it? He had written the wolf. He had like done a whole other thing for the wolf in one of his other movies. I feel like and that there was like a talk of that he had written. Was the wolf supposed to appear? You know, because Kaitel played him. I feel like the wolf was somebody who was supposed to continue a little bit in one of his future films, but it never happened. But uh Kind of also like the mysterious nature of that character because, like, again, what is his deal? He seems like he's just kind of like a normal family man, and like, 
has you know he doesn't seem like the type who's probably ever actually got his own hands dirty killing someone but like he'll help you get rid of that shit you know like did you ever get the feeling that he might have i don't know like do you think he's sort of like a jimmy where it's like i he's obviously a lot more uh into the criminal underworld than jimmy is but like I don't know. I don't gather that he's like a like a down hard, a hard gangster. He doesn't get mad when Vince is talking shit. He's just like, you know, I'm sorry if I offended you, but we need to move this really quick. Pretty please of sugar. Well, I think he's supposed to be a professional and he does crime. He, he facilitates the criminal activity of other people. He's a logistics manager for crime. <laughs> okay, it's a good way to put it. Like, and there, though, that is a hallowed tradition in 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 criminal films. I think uh, I think of Tom Noonan and Heat as a similar type of guy. That's a great that's a great comparison, actually. Now that you say that, that's a really great comparison. Um, he's a he's a I try to remember what the uh, middle management class that people get really mad at on Twitter PMC. About is. <laughs> yeah he's the he's the pmc of the criminal underworld uh i love too how vincent and jules just argue like a married couple while they're cleaning the car like it, they're like bickering like a, a, just an old married couple like and again you get so this is the, this whole i kind of forget too again watching this how little of the movie samuel jackson is actually in you know yeah. what I mean? Like it is very little. He's at the beginning and you don't see him again until the final what like we get the last like half hour of the movie. Mm -hmm. Um but I mean god does he run away with everything in that final half yeah. hour. I'm a mushroom cloud land motherfucker motherfucker. This, this is some fucked up repugnant shit is a, a line that I have yeah. said for years since I oh, watched yeah, this me movie. Too. <laughs> but then you get to see why they're in those dorky clothes and I love I love how uh Samuel Jackson is like your clothes, motherfucker. When he's talking, that about is very like, good. Yeah, it's uh, it's sort of a <laughs> Hegelian thing. Like, oh, you, you you have to see the clothes on someone else to realize that they're dorky. <laughs> but I like how the clothes are so dorky that even Julia Sweeney, like her character, rips on their clothes yeah. when they you guys go to a car. volleyball game or something. <laughs> and then the wolf is gone. What a fucking character, though. What a great yeah. little cameo he has. But this is where we bring it back full circle. We go back to the beginning. Vincent and Jules are eating breakfast at the same time. Uh, Honey Bunny and Pumpkin rob the restaurant, and uh, Jules is still talking about quitting the life because he of the miracle, quote unquote miracle. And again, I love that Vince misses everything because he's taking a shit. Like he yeah. he is not present for all of this going. Which honestly, in this situation, is a, is better. You know what I mean? Like it is better for them that he because he would again he almost ruins everything when he comes back out. And I like it's all in dedication to his partner. And I, I you I do like the scene too, where because you just seen them bicker and bitch, and then they like you do realize they'd have that. I don't remember what the joke is, any but where like he says something. Oh, it's when he's talking about we eating pig and you know how it better be charming. And uh like there's that like genuine warm, like, oh, these two are buddies, you know what I mean? Because it almost you kind of forget that they like not just partners, they're 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 friends, they're friendly, and mm -hmm. uh that's that's that source of com sense of camaraderie that like vincent comes out of the bathroom and uh you know almost fucks everything up as as jules is trying to like become the righteous man you know that that that's his that's his character arc. And jules plays that whole scene cool as fucking hell too you know what i mean like he uh mm -hmm. doesn't lose his cool he doesn't you don't get the samuel jackson you know he even just very calmly says the ezekiel line you know yeah. and uh just that incredible monologue that he gives and that the bad motherfucker wallet too, obviously is like, of course, one of the once said bad motherfucker. <laughs> um, but yeah, he lets them live and he leaves and Jules and Vince do the same. And, and that's the end. I mean, it brings it right back to where it all started. So um, yeah, it is just one person has decided to change his life and we know, we don't know what's going to happen, but we know that thing we don't, we know he has possibilities. The other one, He's not, he is not, he is skeptical. He turned away from uh, that moment, that, that, uh, that potential miracle. And he gets his ass uh, blown away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, really, and it's, it is funny that the only main character who dies is, is Vincent. You know what I mean? Like yeah. no one else, none of the other mains die. Because Marvin's he's the one main. who had a moment of truth that he uh, denied. That he yep. refused to accept because he was a fucking dumbass. <laughs> and because he decided to leave his gun on the counter when he took a shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. But that's Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Um, 
okay, you know what? Uh, this shifts for me a bunch. We talked about this last time, and it's been we last did this a year ago. Any shifts on your ultimate Tarantino ranking? Having just watched this one, what a, what a favorite Tarantino movie has that changed at all since we last spoke? Because I told you this, it sometimes fluctuates based on whatever one I most recently watched. Sometimes, yeah, definitely, that's true for me too. I am I'm a cuck now, where I and just because I'm older, uh, I I find his later works uh, more satisfying. Like right now, I'm I probably would put. Uh, uh, once upon a time on Hollywood and Inglorious Bastards as my two, I think his best works. Uh, yeah, but I, uh, Pulp Fiction you know, will never be dethroned from the way that it made me feel when I first saw it, and the way that it shaped my sensibility afterwards. So yeah, it's like it's a separate, it's 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 in its own zone because of that. Well, I, like I said, lad, in my heart, Jackie Brown will always be my favorite. I love Jackie Brown, but like I'm also with you that like Inglorious Bastards probably would be my other like mm -hmm. choice if i were picking yeah i i, I love i love inglorious bastards you need to watch once upon a time again did you watch the split up mini series for hateful eight when they split it into like yeah. a six part mini series did you like hateful eight that much first time you saw it as a as a, like a film? i liked it i mean it, it it was not it didn't hit me that much when i first saw it i do i do i mean i i enjoyed the hell out of it i enjoy all i enjoy every tarantino movie it's it's he has not had a dud in my view uh but it was not one that immediately spoke to me necessarily. Did you? Cause, okay. I am absolutely like 100% parallel to, or with, in line with what you just said, like to a T that's how I feel about Tarantino's movies and that movie in general. Did you like the miniseries more? Cause I have not gotten to it yet. Uh, it's, it's, it, it gives it a little more residence around the edges, but, uh, I mean, I appreciate it more. I, I end up over time, everything ends up winning me over, you know, like even <laughs> at some point I am brought to really appreciating, but I, I think it's worth checking out. Although I think it's gone now. I think they took it off Netflix. Oh, dad, there's, there's, I'm sure there are uh, quote unquote ways to find it. So. Well, maybe for you, but I don't know how to use the computer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into the soundtrack, I want to thank all of my listeners. And I want to remind you that if you want to keep this show going and you want to show your support, you can do so over at www.patreon.com forward slash soundtrack. For as little as $3 a month, you can help make sure this show keeps going. For $6 a month, you get bonus episodes. For $8 a month, you get bonus episodes and access to future miniseries. I cannot stress enough how the only way the show is going to keep going is through listener support. This is entirely self-produced and it's been running on fumes for the last few months. So even if you're not interested in the bonus episodes, any support you show the show will ensure that you get your four episodes a month that you've been getting since the show started. So once again, if you like the show, please make sure that you go and check out the Patreon, because only you can help keep this show going. Thank you. All right, well, let's do the soundtrack here. So the soundtrack released on September 27th, 1997, and it followed a similar template to Reservoir Dogs in that it used a combination of songs and snippets of dialogue from the film itself. There was a 2002 release. Did you get the 2002 re-release by any chance? It had four of the seven songs that were in the movie but didn't make the original soundtrack. No, I didn't know that happened. And then there was like a 15-minute uh, extended interview with Quentin Tarantino at the very end. There's like a long interview with him that oh, ends man, the, like no. one side. I of owned, I had that. I bought that immediately. I had, I play that CD all the time, but I did not know that they added songs to an edition. Goddamn. Yeah, uh, we're talking about now. The, we're going to talk about the original 1997 release, but um, you can you can find that new one. again if you if you there are ways to find it. Actually, YouTube. You can go to YouTube. You that you know how to use that. <laughs> that I can use. So I will do that. <laughs> so the the soundtrack didn't make much of a dent when it first came out like it just it didn't sell a whole lot of copies but it eventually after the academy awards and all the you know pulp fiction became the phenomenon that it became it peaked at number 21 in the billboard charts and it sold three and a half million copies in the u.s that's triple platinum i was that one is, of them it is i have it i bought it on so the soundtrack for this, I actually bought the soundtrack for this on vinyl when you and I recorded Reservoir Dogs. They had it at the store here in town. And I was like, this will come in handy down the road someday. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was really cool to find this on vinyl like that. But uh, it, it sold you know, it sold a whole lot of copies internationally as well. Uh, you know, had hundreds of thousands of copies in, in the UK. And so humongous, humongous soundtrack. And it brought about a surf rock revival. 
So because of this, the soundtrack advertisers started using surf music in their commercials to like sell everything from burritos to toothpaste. And uh, it made surf music really popular again. And even in the early 2000s, early 2010s, there was like surf influenced indie rock. There were like 800 indie rock bands that had surf in their name in like Mm -hmm. a decade later, you know, Uh, and you could trace that right back to this album. And these people were children when this came out and then got to the point where they wanted to make music themselves. And guess what they went for surf influenced indie rock. So Mm -hmm. uh, the top 10, the week that this album came out though, number one was Janet Jacks. Janet's the velvet rope. She wasn't Janet Jackson at the time, just Janet. Number two was the gang related soundtrack. Number three was Leanne Rhymes. You light up my life. Number four was boys to men's evolution. Number five was the soul food soundtrack. Number six was Mariah Carey's Butterfly. Number seven was Fleetwood Max The Dance. Number eight was Aqua's Aquarium, which is a really, uh, I'm sure, one that there's at least one person listening to this. It was like cringe, like cringing a little bit at the fact that they own that at one point. Uh, number nine was Masterpiece Ghetto D, which I can say I owned at the time that this came out. And uh, number 10 was Trisha Yearwood's Songbook, a collection of hits. Now, Further down the chart, these are three albums by known artists that never cracked the Billboard Top 10. And again, just to show you how many fucking millions of albums you had to sell to make the Top 10 at one point when people still bought music. Number 22, you had Sugar Ray's Floored, which peaked at number 12, the one with I Just Want to Fly on it, which is a fucking, as you know, Matt, being my age, uh, pretty inescapable song at that time. Oh, yeah. Put your arms around me, baby. (laughs) <laughs> and it influenced the rest of their career for better or worse because that that album was not like that song uh number 32 was epmd's back in business which peaked at number 16 and here's actually another one that i was surprised never made the top 10 because look we we again i think are you i don't remember are you i think you might be exactly major are we both 42 mm-hmm Okay, so uh, as somebody who went to high school dances around this time, you'll be shocked to learn this. At number 105, Casey and JoJo's Love Always only peaked at number 24. That is pretty shocking to me because those two songs off of that, All My Life and the other big one, like I associate with the one that I remember more. Yeah, and I'm trying to remember the other name. Yeah, All My Life was like, I mean, that was like a high school dance staple for like, I might even play them now for who the fuck. I don't know. It might still be something they play high school dances, but uh, this is the, there's one lone soundtrack original on this. That's it's all the rest are, comes from existing albums. And I'll obviously talk about those as I get to them. Plus it has the dialogue snippets. The ones that are their own separate tracks. We won't really be covering to any great extent. We're only mostly going to talk about the tracks, but this is uh, you know, like Reservoir Dogs, and like we said during Reservoir Dogs, sometimes the like dialogue snippets in a soundtrack can be annoying, and a lot of movies followed Tarantino's lead doing this, but they're always kind of fun in the Tarantino ones because you can just like immediately picture like, mm-hmm. the scene as you're hearing it. Um, but yeah, we're not going to cover those unless they're a part of the song. But number one, we've got Dick Dale and his Deltones with Miserloo from the album Surf in USA. Yes. And that- yeah, opens up the honey bunny and pumpkin dialogue, you know, like perfectly in line with the movie. Um, so Miserlou is actually a folk song from the Eastern Mediterranean region. And the author of the song, no one knows who the original author was, but there's Arabic, Greek, and Jewish musicians playing it by the 1920s. Um, earliest known recording is a 1927 Greek version of the song, but there's belly dancing versions, Albanian, Armenian, Serbian, Persian, Indian, Turkish, all, you know, it's, it's, it's been done all over the place. and. Uh, the song was was popular from the 1920s onwards in like Arab American, Armenian American, Greek Greek American communities. So the first American hit version of the song came from Jan August in 1946. This is so I remember the song in Guitar Hero being one of the most difficult songs to play. And I was a little pissed when I found this out. Dale came up with this version. Not that it's not a hard song to play, but Dale came up with this version when he was bet by a young fan that he couldn't play a song only using one string of his guitar. And he remembered that his father and uncles were Lebanese American musicians. And he remembered seeing them play this song on one string of the ode. And so he basically, what he did was he took that and he just jacked the song's tempo up to make it into rock and roll. And so that version of the song is what introduced it to wider audiences in the U S and, uh, yeah, I do. I think it's bullshit though, because in Guitar Hero, you got to hit fucking twenty five different notes at once, and like, you know, I could, I could tap that, I could tap that fucking button a bunch of times really fast. I don't it think the it's the screen. same principle, is the thing, <laughs> and I think that is very funny that they have a game that's based on the guitar that is not at all like playing a guitar. I think that's funny. 
<laughs> no, but it's a, it's crazy to me kind of learn how the song originated because it sounds like this song sounds like 25 guitars on top of one another. You know what I yeah. mean? Like I would have never guessed. But the, the, the thing about this too, Tarantino has such an ear for music. Like this song's basically in the movie's DNA at this point. Now they associate it so strongly. But uh, yeah, it just kicks off the movie so well. It's a fucking great song. <laughs> Oh yeah, just yeah, at, get you getting you pumped. That I definitely did never never skipped it when I was playing the album. Uh, so that leads us to number two, "Cool in the Gang" with Jungle Boogie from their album "Wild and Peaceful," a uh, huge hit for the band, number four on the charts. And again, this is another one. I love this one because there's so much going on in this song. You know what I mean? Like there's a yeah. shit ton happening. Uh, the horn part is just as catchy as any chorus I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. Um, and my favorite thing about this song is the guy in the background going, get up, get down. You know, like get the guy down, who's like, get saying, down. <laughs> uh, huh, get down. Say, uh, huh, I'm walking. I'm walking with the jungle boogie. Get out. Get down. Down with the boogie. Say, uh. And then the, the little, funk, like, y'all. you hear him in the background going, oh my God, I love that shit. I love it. That the, the uh, jungle boogie uh, is the equivalent on, of uh, on the Reservoir Dog soundtrack, uh, I Gotcha by Joe Tex. That's the same type of song with the same sort of guttural uh, 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 voice work. Yeah. Well, and it, I like to, yeah, it, and that's a, yeah, it is. It's, it's, it was him looking for another, yeah, another, I got you here. And like, I, they even like, he even gets his own bit at the end where it's just like, they actually like focus on him. He's just like doing Tarzan sounds. God, it's so oh. good. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously, God damn, we haven't even talked about like the, the get down, get down. It, there's oh, so yeah. much. You know I'm saying? There's yep. so much about that. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. Wonderful. And then we go right to after that. God, what a fucking, what a goddamn track list this has. Right to Al Green's Let's Stay Together from the album of the oh, same yeah. name. Oh, yeah, great. Um, great song. Oh, God. And I've talked about I, and the, uh, the Dead Presidents episode that I did with Felix. I talked about, you know, I, I am a fucking huge, huge fan of classic soul music. It's probably my favorite of all the genres. Like, it is, it, I love, love Stax, Motown, Philly, like, all of it, all of it. I'm just a humongous fan. And, uh, you know, so like, yeah, going right to an Al Green song, which I would even say is probably one of his, you know, I would, I, you could make a strong argument that this is like if his, I don't think it's his best song, but I could see you making a strong argument that this is his best song. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, going right to that. I mean, this song was huge too. Uh, number one on the billboard 100, it stayed on the billboard 100 for 16 weeks and it topped the the R and B chart for nine weeks. It was ranked the number 11 song of 1972, uh, 60th greatest song of all time by Rolling Stone when they did their 500 greatest songs of all time. It's been covered by Tina Turner and a whole bunch of other people. It's in the the National Recording Registry by the Library of Congress as a you know culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant song. Um, I just love like the hiccupy instrumentation that opens it up to that. Doo, doo, doo. Yeah, it's great, and then it settles into that smooth groove, and it's just I and mean, it's a pretty song. Al Green's vocals are like top notch in this, and that harmonizing on the chorus, yeah. It's 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 fucking phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome. Uh, and then we get to like our our, our, our you know because this is a surf rock heavy soundtrack, and the first one is Tornado's Busted Surfboards from the album of the same name. And this was they never achieved anything near the success of this song. Uh, they had this is funny. They had a follow up single called Shooting Beavers that they banned from the radio for having a suggestive title. So that kind of like kneecapped <laughs> them. Um, and uh, they continued to perform all the way to 2010s though. So uh, I you know. I, I surf rock is one of those genres that I like, but I pretty much never think to play. I'm talking like legit surf rock. I was really into that like indie surf rock shit that I got. And I said, there's like a hundred bands with surf name, surf in the name. I probably listened to like 70 of them at that time in my life. But um, unless you count the beach boys as surf rock, like, I, and I, I mean, technically I guess they kind of are, but not like this, not this flavor of surf rock. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if you count the beach boys, I guess I listen to surf rock quite often, but like, I don't and like I don't listen to this that much but I really like it uh and this is like a really quality surf rock song you know like um, I like the uh the little the bridge move the the guitar solo and the bridge very nice oh yeah and then it's got that really extended twangy guitar like all of the hallmarks of 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 surf rock like inobtrusive drums but the drums are like a huge driving force yeah it's it's great it's great uh they definitely like a blueprint for for surf rock that followed you know you can see why it was mm-hmm. uh, so at number five we've got <clears throat> ricky nelson with lonesome town from the album ricky sings again which is again huge hit at the time number seven on the charts uh 
there was a particular strain of bummer song in the 1950s that I really love. And this might be like my ultimate example of what I mean when I say that, like there's like a, a, a dusty ethereal, almost like it's coming from another transmission from like another place sort of sound to this, you know? Yeah. Um, there's Lone, like, well, so that way it ends with the, the haunted chorus, like lonesome town. Yeah, it's it's I love this. I really love this song. And I will say it's now granted I listen to him a lot anyway. Uh, Town Without Pity, I think, would be another one in that genre. Well, there's no coincidence here. Yes, that's a actually yes, that would be another really great one. There's some bad ones out of that era, but like I'm a I'm a big fan of that, whatever you would call that particular. But the, the, there's no coincidence that when I listen so I listen to this on Spotify for the show. Uh listen to it on on my vinyl when i was at home but like when i'd be out and about you know obviously i can't do that sort of listen to it on spotify and uh the song that spotify went to after i listened to this song was elliot smith's between the bars and like i'm not <laughs> kidding when i say like this is a forerunner to like singer songwriter stuff like that you know what i mean yeah. like bummy singer songwriter stuff and uh yeah i i love his i love the way he opens each verse i love the vocal work that he does when he opens each verse with it's sort of like it's great it's great i really love this there's song. a place where lover go- lovers go yeah, it's so good. Uh, and then, and again, this is, it's so funny to go from that to fucking Son of a Preacher Man by Dusty Springfield, which is like, it's, it's, it's just one of the, it's from Dusty in Memphis, reached number 10 on the charts. It was her first, her last top 30 hit until 1987 when she did a song with the Pet Shop Boys. But this was originally written for Aretha Franklin, who mm-hmm. recorded her own version the next year. And I, I said before, as much as I love Old Soul, I dislike most Blue Eyed Soul, but there are exceptions. And Dusty is like the ultimate exception to. Yeah, no, not- that song has got the soul coming out the yin yang it's i mean yeah it's that beginning that doo like it just uh, uh, it immediately i can i think this is one of those songs that like if if it comes on there's no chance i'm turning it off you know what i mean like, oh yeah absolutely chance. not you gotta wait you gotta how, how how are you gonna not hear the fucking when oh how i remember was <laughs> in his eye kid. kid you gotta hear that part yeah, the, like the it's 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 just it just it grabs you immediately that that really cool sort of country twangy that soul still still undoubtedly soul opening notes. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah, you can't come on. No, it's it's fantastic. Um, and that leads us to the Centurions Bullwinkle Part Two from their album Surfer Pajama Party, which sounds like a Mister Show <laughs> joke. Um, <laughs> yes dr retarded definitely has that one on lp in his house in his, in his mom's house <laughs> and this is it opens with the zed's dead baby bit but this is one of there are so tarantino has a lot of populist sort of shit on here you know what i mean like there's some like yeah. as i've said almost every song i mentioned so far has been like a standard aura but he has three very obscure songs on here and this is the first of them uh this band hadn't worked together in three decades they only had like one, two albums or something and like vanished into obscurity, but they reformed because of their inclusion in this movie. And uh, again, this is what I would call another like prototype surf rock track. Only this one has horns. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's cool. And that doesn't, not saying in a bad way. It doesn't stand out from the others, but that's fine. Surf rock's not for that. Like I hate this. I say this word jokingly a lot of times, but genuinely surf rock is like the, it's a vibe. Example. It is. It is. It's a vibe. It's a vibe. It's a vibe. It's a vibe genre. And uh, this is a good one. It's a great vibe. Yeah, I would. I I would admit that I sometimes would uh, skip this one when I was playing because I'd be like, okay, I, I yeah. If I and wasn't I, feeling it, I I would I would go past uh, Bullwinkle Part Two. And I could absolutely. It is definitely a good song. I could absolutely see that because. I mean, look, as much as I love, uh, again, like I said, I'm a, I do like surf rock, but like I am, I am also uh, a. That's why I don't do scores on here very often. I'm a, I'm I look, I'm a, I'm a, give me some lyrics, give me a chorus sort of person. I've always been that way. Mm-hmm. Unashamedly, now that I've gotten older, I don't care. I was weaned on like pop music. You know, I grew up during the era of like yeah. Madonna, Michael Jackson and shit. Like, what do you want from me? <laughs> uh, so at number eight, we've got Chuck Berry with You Never Can Tell from the album St. Louis to Liverpool. Uh, opens the twist, con- opens with the twist contest dialogue. Um, the follow-up single to this is the follow-up single to Barry's last top 10 hit of the 60s, which was no particular place to go. This peaked at number 14, and it was his final top 40 hit until my dingling came out. A his only later. number one. His I only know, number I one know hit this. was my dingling. 
<laughs> oh, that sucks so bad because Chuck Berry is so fucking good. Uh, I love his vocal work on this. I don't, again, another word I don't use to describe things very often, but his vocal work is like very slippery on this. Like it like, oh, yeah. it like slides around a lot, but it slips from one line to the next. But And this song doesn't rock like a lot of his stuff did, but the, this is a toe tapper. To use another term I don't use. I'm just like, this is- Oh, the, you're ta- I'm the, tapping my toe. <laughs> uh it's the perfect way to describe this song it comes on and i'm just like you're not going to get up and like necessarily even though they do the twist to it for me I'm, i can't dance for shit maybe that's why but like i will absolutely tap my toe when this one comes on <laughs> and, it, and it's uh one of those songs which i always appreciate as a history nerd that has embedded within it lost culture because the coolerator was an actual uh brand name refrigerator in the 50s oh really yeah, coolerators. That was that was. I'm sure they thought they were going to eventually overtake refrigerator as like what people called it, like Q-tips or band aids or something. But it didn't <laughs> quite happen. Well, you know, I told you, I told you before we recorded that I just did Zodiac, and uh, yeah. obviously the big song in that on the soundtrack is her, the centerpiece is Hurdy Gurdy Man. And, oh yes, uh, oh mwah. I, I know such a tremendous use of that. Uh, my girlfriend was like what's a hurdy gurdy and i was like i don't know because i know donovan you know i love that song but like donovan's like mellow yellow and sunshine superman i'm not a big fan of like that bubblegum psych shit but um you know my i dismissively was like i don't know it's probably some hippie bullshit and then she looked it up and she's like no it's an instrument yeah (laughs) i had no idea you turn it it's like a crank on it i know i want to play one now they look cool it's like a humongous fucking thing yeah so yeah, that's another song about like a. It, it is still, ultimately, at the end of the day, it is still is a bunch of hippie bullshit. But uh, what an <laughs> ominous, what an ominous song it is. Uh, okay, so up next at number nine, we've got "Urge Overkill" with "Girl, You'll Be a Woman Soon," which is a Neil Diamond cover from their 1992 EP "Stall." Uh, you know what's funny? This was not as big of a hit as I seem to remember because I remember oh, yeah. the song. I thought this was video. this was boom. This is I remember the video. Yeah. No, this only topped at number 59 on the Billboard 100. That's as high as it got on the Billboard 100, which is I guess fucking crazy. You know, that, that might be a blessing because a while ago, I remember thinking about this song and thinking, God, it must suck to be a one-hit wonder where the hit was a cover. Because <laughs> then, I mean, not only did you always feel like, oh, my stuff was never good enough to break through, but also just on a purely crass commercial level, you're splitting those royalties so you're not even getting the, the the pecuniary benefits of a hit, but apparently it wasn't even that big of a hit. <laughs> yeah, poor urge overkill. They got a Wesley Willis song out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my two cover song questions that I ask every time was this one different enough from the original to justify existing? Honestly, barely. There's just a few note changes, and like if you you change a few notes on this, it is it is different enough. But it really isn't terribly good. It's I forgot fine. how close it, 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 it This is another one that I, I never really loved and I would occasionally skip when listening to the album. I could see that too, because honestly, coming back to it, I was like, eh. why why is this? Why is this uh, a thing? That's I have to I assume thinking. that the reason they didn't use Neil Diamond's version would had to have been like licensing costs with the movie. Yeah, something but like that. It works because it does seem like Mia does seem like somebody who would have been into like early nineties alt rock stuff, like urge overkill. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, so it works that way too. Anyway, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a fine cover, but I, 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 I agree with you that like, I, I coming back and listening to this, I've heard the song enough. I didn't really need to listen to it a bunch. So when I would be listening to the soundtrack as a whole, I would be like, eh, you know what? I could skip this one. <laughs> um, so at number 10, we've got Maria McKee with If Love is a Red Dress, Hang Me in Rags, which is the lone soundtrack original. It was on an EP before this song track came out called Let Me Soothe You, but it was like a stripped down demo. So she beefed the song up for the soundtrack. She was in a band called Lone Justice, and she had a moderate hit in the 90s with the song Show Me Heaven, which was in the Days of Thunder soundtrack. That was like her other claim to fame. But she's been a very consistent musician. She does a lot of session music work now. And and this is actually the oddball here in this soundtrack. Urge Overkill would be too if they weren't covering a classic song, but like this is like a very 1994. It's not a 1994 song because it has that like, it's got that sort of like throwback to like old dusty country music, but like yeah. it's still like the one lone, like this wasn't plucked from anything else or it's not a cover of an old song. You know what yeah. I mean? We do um, know that uh, I'm sure she was flattered by this when the movie came out that this is the song that Maynard is soulfully like intently listening to on the radio when Butch crashes into the pawn shop. 
Yeah, yeah. You really, want, it, you really want that to be the guy who's really digging your song. <laughs> but I actually really love this one that like West that that. Oh like, yeah, it's like great. I said, well, and you know what? You know where else this movie popped up? The 1999 movie Bats with Lou Diamond Phillips. This song appears in that movie as well. Ah, which. Might I add, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring here. Bats is a really fucking fun movie that doesn't deserve the reputation that it has. It's a fun, like, they don't, it's like a, they don't make them like this movie any, you make them like this anymore movie. Like, it's just a, like a, a fun monster movie. But yeah, there's a scene in a bar, the way this song plays in that movie, there's a guy sitting eating at a, like a dive bar and like this song's playing and it cuts to this. It's such a funny scene. This like three foot long bat crawling up beside him on the bar and he somehow doesn't have the peripheral to see that it's coming <laughs> until it leaps on him and knocks him across the bar it's and it's it's funny but yeah i love this song but when it popped up in that movie i was like this i did i was like this is the song in pulp fiction <laughs> when when uh they enter zed shop or, or whalen shop whatever his name is maynard but maynard that's it yeah i could remember his name so at number 11, we've got the Revels, Comanche, from their album On a Rampage. And it op- this opens with the Bring Out the Gimp dialogue. And this is another one of the obscurities. Uh, Pre-surf rock sort of band, like that they weren't quite, they were actually a little before the surf rock thing was big. And Rampage is their only album. That's it. They don't have another, they do not have another album. This song was not a hit. Like, so however this one was picked out. Well, actually, oh, wait, I forgot. This wasn't the first choice for the scene because this is where yes this is by serona yes it was supposed to be my serona by the neck and they declined on letting him use it yeah because Um, apparently uh one of them had become a born-again christian and he was offended by the content and then they ended up giving it to reality bites instead (laughs) which i think is the same year yeah so yep that's and it did get like a revival because of being in that uh oh i have to say you know obviously you're always going to be biased by having experienced the reality there's just something uh menacing about that song about rampage that oh yeah uh that my sharona would not have and with my sharona in that scene it kind of would i think fatally undercut it because it would be it would be what people kind of at the time were criticizing unfairly tarantino for which was just this blithe uh, 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 conflation of like pop culture and ultra violence when that's not really the case. Like uh, the scene in Reservoir Dogs, where he's tortured, where uh, Mr. Blonde is torturing Marvin Nash while listening to uh, pop music. That song that they pick, uh, the Steelers Wheel song, it has a menacing, uh, uh, scary element that that adds to what you're seeing rather than contrasts with it. And this song has a, a a savage heart that my Sharona would not have had. And I 100% agree that. And then like, there's a saxophone sort of like a, like a scream. Like, yes. like you know, how, how, uh, in Steelers wheel, there's, it, it, he goes, please. The equivalent to that. in this song is that, is that screaming throaty saxophone. Yes. Yeah, it's it's I really I love and I and I can't remember there was a movie that I did recently that had a song too that like it seems incongruous with what's going on and I was like me and I, I'll never remember what it is off the top of my head but like Tarantino is a good year for that we're like because you're saying this I'm like is it because I'm, I, I associate this song so strongly with the scene but I don't think that's the case I think you're right there's like a dark heart to these songs or like stuck in the middle yeah. that works and there's a song I talked about this recently with where like yeah if you pick the right song you can find a dark heart at the like in certain poppy sort of songs or this one's not poppy necessarily like like stuck in the middle is but yeah I can't imagine my Sharona being this the song in this scene can't do it so that would be like a joke right and like I guess too you and I again again you remember was it my Chalupa there was a, there was a whole bunch of like things that like use my Sharona after reality bites to mm-hmm. like where they would use something in place of Sharona. My, mm-hmm. yeah. Like, so I agree. There's like too much, there's too many associations with my Sharona that would take that scene, take you out of the scene, I think. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, thank God they did Comanche and thank God the guy from the next was born again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so at number 12, we've got Statler Brothers, Flowers on the Wall from the album of the same name. This was uh, like a huge hit for them, peaking at number four. Uh, for those who don't know, Statler Brothers got their break opening and performing as backup singers for Johnny Cash for like 10 years. Um, that was kind of how they got their start. They were his like, yeah, backup singers and opening performed his own opening act. But I like how this song could almost be mistaken for like a psychedelic drug song. Like it would almost be like an ode to LSD, but like, like filtered through. Yeah, like country, uh, but- look about my back door. 
Right, exactly. But it's really just a song about being sad and not leaving your house because someone broke up with you. It's actually a really funny song, honestly. Last uh, night like, I dressed in tails, pretending I was on the town. Long yeah. as I can dream, it's hard to hold this swinger down. Yeah, like he's singing like he's having the best time of his life, but he's basically describing bottoming out from depression. Yep. <laughs> it's yep. great. Uh, something else I noticed about this, because I actually watched Die Hard with a Vengeance fairly recently. The part, so in this, in Die Hard with a Vengeance, in this movie, he sings the song along with it while it's on the radio. And in Die Hard with a Vengeance, when they ask why he got suspended, he says, smoking cigarettes and watching Captain Kangaroo, which is like a quote from this song, too. And those movies yep. are like a year apart. So I don't know if that was intentional or I can't, I'm, I don't I'm know, pretty because, sure. But they were, but you had to think that, like, maybe not. I was thinking, like, with them coming so close that maybe, like, they were kind of in production. One was in production while the other was, like, kind of being edited. But yeah, you're probably right. I'm sure it was a nod to this. Um, and then we close with the lively one, Surf Rider from the album Surf. It's so funny. The song's called Surf Rider. The album's called Surf Riders, plural. Uh, and this is the final obscurity. They did covers mostly, but this was an original song and they disbanded in 1967. Again, the two albums and vanished, or maybe the three albums or whatever, vanished into obscurity. But uh, so there's some songs in this genre and maybe the, the and we you talked about it with Comanche. I actually had it for this one where there's like an entire, it's funny, I actually forgot that I had this in my notes. I was agreeing with you, but on this song, there's like an inherent sinisterness to uh, some surf rock. And this one has that too, I think. It's mm -hmm. it's very bass heavy. Um, and it's they, they, they can make it sound jury and it's very prevalent on this one. As far as it goes, it's one that I could skip as well if I had to, but yeah. it's still a really, it's a good closer though. It's a good way oh, to it's, end it's it. It's perfect as outro. a way to like bring everything together at the end, yeah, but... Um, I guess that's yeah. kind of why uh, I would I would stop listening because you know it's like oh the fun's over now it's like the <laughs> it's the you got to leave now song <laughs> just like the end credit song yeah you, know, like, you filter out what it's going on um, okay saxophone's so, great in it though yes it is it is uh, yeah it's a, no it's it's a cool I mean like I said it's a cool it it comes back to it's a vibe it's a vibe I hate saying it but they, they yeah, can no no you can't rock. define you can't talk about say, surf rock any other way I mean there's no fucking there's no there's no lyrics, for Christ's sake, you know? What else, what else, <laughs> right. what else is it but vibes? <laughs> vibes only in surf rock. Yeah. Uh, so that's the soundtrack. Uh, we'll do a quick wrap up here and we'll, we'll call it a day. So songs in the movie, not on the soundtrack. And these, these four that I'm about to mention are the ones that made the expanded edition. So you've got mm -hmm. the Robin since I first met you. Link Ray and his men's rumble, which honestly, I wish had been on here. That's the do 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 You know, that. Yeah, uh, with the, uh with the, the the twilight zone thing yes right uh my girlfriend's dad has that as his ringtone which is very funny um the brothers johnson strawberry letter number 23 and the markets out of limits so those four are on there and then the other three gary shirell's waiting in school another link ran his men song which is ace of spades and finally you've got woody thorne's teenagers in love so that's that's everything accounted for is it on spotify the only song missing is the Rebels Comanche, and that includes all the snippets from the movie. Amazingly, it's all on there. Everything's on there, but Comanche. Um, so uh, let me ask Tarantino. You. He double dipped there with the Strawberry Alarm, uh, Strawberry Letter Twenty Three song, which is also on the pulp, uh, the Jackie Brown. It's in Jackie Brown and the Jackie Brown soundtrack. Yeah. So he well, he got to it eventually. Is what happened. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Matt. I know the answers to these already, but let me ask you: the movie, would you consider it an essential? Would you say stream it or would you say skip it? You gotta what? What are you talking about? If you haven't seen it, you gotta see it. And <laughs> and honestly, if you watch it and you're like, "What's the big deal?" That's part of it too, because you will at least have experienced a the historical uh, uh, revelation of like, oh, all the stuff that I've seen a million times now. Uh, the the gimmicks and, and affects of a, a certain type of independent and, and uh, cinema that emerged out of the 90s and, and that by now I, I am not impressed by this is where it comes from yeah and it's and I, I although it's hard for me to imagine like watching this movie it's the one thing about this too is it is, although, I don't know, it's kind of like the band Big Star. You know, Big Star, I love Big Star, but I know people that have been like, well, I don't understand what the big deal is. But it's the same deal where, like, there's so much power pop that is borrowed directly from Big Star that when you go back and listen to it, people that go back and listen to it are like, well, I don't see what the big deal is. So maybe there's that sort of effect, but this is such a people pleaser. You know what I mean? Like, it's two and a half hours. It never feels anything like two and a half hours long. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, 
I did two of those in a row this week. Like I said, Zodiac, two movies that I watched this week that are like two hours and 40 minute beefy motherfuckers that feel like they blow by in like 90 minutes. Yep. <laughs> like, uh, but, you know, it's an essential. No fucking question. But I have to ask it. I have to ask it. Uh, and then the soundtrack, same deal. Essential soundtrack, stream the soundtrack, skip the soundtrack or cherry pick certain songs off of it. It's uh, I mean, I've just been thinking, looking back at this of how of how cohesive it is and how it has a a sustained menacing uh cool feeling it's like being in the movie in a way that that's what you want out of a soundtrack so it's it's not not only are the songs good but the way that they're laid out and and uh in the soundtrack is its own uh contribution to it so absolutely listen to that yeah it's an essential it's an essential i mean it's it's it again it also inspired fucking decade worth of soundtracks and albums and and musicians that were yeah so it's you know no question uh do the two go well together the music and the movie and the movie itself the soundtrack and the movie do you think they go well together oh yeah it's 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 uh it's all a piece that's what makes it so impressive i know i know i feel silly i like there's certain ones where i feel ridiculous asking this but like i gotta i gotta i gotta follow the template here um the funny thing about this is though on paper not really but execution wise goddamn yeah like if you just read this script and it was like i'm gonna have uh the statler brothers and i'm gonna have some surf yeah, rock a bunch of surf like, rock yeah yeah uh okay what are your top three songs ah uh, i'm gonna go jungle boogie uh son of a preacher man and uh honestly maybe comanche okay for me it's dick dale's miserloo Number two, Al Green's Let's Stay Together. And number three, uh, Dusty Springfield, Son of a Preacher Man. But the like the Ricky Nelson song was close. This was a tough one. Like, look, if Jungle Boogie isn't one of my considerations, you've put together a pretty no, fucking it's, good it's, song. Uh, it's ridiculous because the ones you mentioned that I didn't also, like, yes, I could put them on there too. I, I would, <laughs> yeah. you'd not be able to argue. Uh, you can argue me into that position easily. Yeah. Um, okay. Further watching, further listening. So we talked a little bit about how there have been a lot of Pulp Fiction inspired movies in the years after mostly bad, but some good. I'm going to name a few that uh, range anywhere from at least watchable. And that's what these are. You've got things to do in Denver when you're dead, the big hit. And again, I'm not saying these are great, but they're at least they're movies that I enjoyed at late night in college when I was, you know, 20 years old. Um, the big hit suicide Kings are all at least watchable, but I want to yeah. give a special shout out to two of them go and the way of the gun, which fucking kick ass. Like those mm. are probably the best of a lot. Yes. Those are both very good. Christopher yeah. McQuarrie, uh, uh, the way of the gun before he became uh, the minion of Tom Cruise. <laughs> yeah i uh and way of the gun is one that i remember everybody no one really liked it when it came out but like i still it has like it's so nasty mind. it's a nasty movie it is it is in every fucking way it is like a very dirty like there's no there's not really any good characters in it other than it is Wolf. awful like, everyone is repulsive uh all the violence is very just brutal and uh not aesthetic it's just like these kind of boxy old white guys in uh, windbreakers just eating shotgun blasts <laughs> it's also got one of the best gunfight scenes at the in the in a movie though in movies at the end that gun yeah, that that final ended, standoff awesome. is so good yeah. um and it has uh the really great uh jeffrey lewis introduction where he's not playing russian roulette but he's playing it by having one gun that has bullets in it one bullet in it and then putting it in a pillowcase He's like pulling guns out of the pillowcase when someone calls him. And I love that scene. It's great. It's a fantastic movie. Um, and then as far as further listening, uh, if you want some more blue, I talked about blue eyed soul, not liking it, but to give one suggestion for blue eyed soul, you've got temptation eyes by the grassroots is a song I love. And then, as I said earlier, dusty in Memphis is an amazing album. Al green's let's stay together. The album that this is from was a great album from front to back. And uh, Dick Dale had a really great greatest hits compilation called better shred than dead, which is very good. And there's a really great surf rock compilation called surf essentials, the best surf compilation ever. And honestly, the title is pretty accurate. It's like four discs of uh, really good surf rock. And it's got pretty much everything you could possibly need on there as like a sampler. So, um, but that's my, that's my suggestions. What did you, you mentioned something earlier that you were like, I don't remember if you remember what it was. Uh, you had said something about, 
checking out. And I was going to tell you to remember that for the end, but I don't remember what it was. But uh, anyway, you said it earlier in the show. So yeah. <laughs> I don't remember yeah. what it was. You, you listened. You know what it is. <laughs> All right. Well, Matt, I, I really seriously appreciate you coming back and doing this. Um, well, of course. Yeah, thanks for having me. Establishing yourself as the Tarantino guy on here. <laughs> yeah, that's me, baby. I'll take that every day. Take that beat, no right. question. <laughs> and uh let everyone know because I, let everyone know where they could find you i mean uh twitter every you know chapo let everyone know where they can find you the floor is yours it's your turn uh chapo trap house is the podcast we've got a patreon with uh episodes there we've got a whole new series on the 30 years war hell on earth that we just wrapped up uh 10 episodes you can listen to it at our patreon web page all right. And I, I will put that. And I always feel, and again, this is like, this is one of those ones where whenever I have you or Felix or Will on there, I'm like, I feel fucking ridiculous being like, <laughs> I don't know where they can find you. <laughs> um, yeah. I will put all of those in the show description. Matt, seriously, I appreciate you coming back on. I had a really good time doing yeah, this me episode. Too. And uh, Pulp Fiction, Tarantino, just really fun to talk about him. I was, got the itch to do it again. So uh, really yeah. glad that you were the one who came back. So, mm-hmm. and, everyone listening at home i appreciate you listening thank you all so much and i hope that all of you have a tremendous weekend ain't no use running ain't nowhere to hide the beast is coming and he's got you in his sights he ain't gonna miss you and he ain't gonna mess around if you're a movie with original songs the soundtrack i'm gonna